Welcome to the Dr. Lori Marbus podcast. I'm Dr. Lori Marbus, and I'll be your host for today's interview with Mr. Jeff Chilton. How are you today, sir? I'm fine, Dr. Marbus. Thank you very much for having me. Oh, please, first of all, call me Lori. <laughs> Hi, Lori. I, I am like the least of the, you know, make sure everyone calls me doctor. Yeah. But, um, but please, you have some amazing story. I'll do the intro, you know, later like we had talked about. But we're going to talk about mushrooms today. And I don't, you know, as I was mentioning earlier, I think it's an underappreciated food, but you're going to talk to us a lot about all aspects of mushrooms. But tell me, first of all, kind of your story and how you got interested in actually becoming a mushroom cultivator or connoisseur almost. So tell me about it. Well, I grew up in the Pacific Northwest. I grew up in Seattle and, and this is a evergreen environment. And the reason it is, is because it rains a lot. We have a lot of water. We have lakes. We have rivers. It's raining. Mushrooms like this kind of climate. So we're really fortunate. This is this is like a treasure trove of mushrooms here in the Pacific Northwest. So I grew up with mushrooms all around me. Uh, I I found uh, uh, I found them fascinating, and also had a chance to go out mushroom hunting with uh, uh, people in the in the early '60s. Uh, 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 fathers of friends. My, my father was not into mushrooms at all, but but I had a friend whose father was a big mushroomer, so I'd go out mushrooming with him, and and so it kind of just I really was interested in in mushrooms in that sense. And then when I went to university, in university I studied anthropology, hmm. and and one of the things uh, you know to bring the mushrooms into it, I I. I realized and, and read about mushrooms being used by indigenous cultures worldwide, not just as food, but also as medicines. So there was a tradition of mushroom use in, in shamanism. And, and so that really fascinated me as well. So I ended up with my degree was actually in ethnomycology. Now they don't have degrees in ethnomycology. That was what I studied in anthropology was, was the use of mushrooms um, by cultures worldwide in, in, in healing. Now, after I, after I left university, there are no jobs for anthropologists, right? <laughs> so, so I, I went to my, my ecology professor and I said, um, you know, Dr. Stins, I'm, I'm kind of interested in, in maybe growing mushrooms. Uh, what do you think? Because he was, he was very supportive of me. I mean, I, I was not in the science department, so I was taking mycology on the side at the university. Mm. And, uh, but, but I had a good relationship with, with him. And he said, well, you know what? There's actually a mushroom farm 60 miles down the road in Olympia. Oh, well, it was the only mushroom farm in Washington State. Oh, <laughs> so wow. he, said, he said, go down and um, talk to the owner, Bill Street, and you might be able to get a job down there. So I went down, I interviewed, and I got a job, and I was just like so excited. I just couldn't believe that I got a job on this mushroom farm. <laughs> and 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 what I didn't what I didn't realize until later was that uh, a mushroom farm is sort of like the the lowest of the low in terms of agricultural labor, and everybody there wanted to go on to a better job. Wow. And even while I was there, because for me, I loved everything about it. I, I was just in, in heaven and on my lunch hour and on breaks, I would be reading about mushroom growing and, and the people I was working with are just like, what are you doing reading about mushrooms? Don't you want to get away from here like the rest of us? I'm like, no, no, I love this. So I, I, I actually uh, stayed and worked on this farm for the next 10 years. Oh, wow. And I literally lived with mushrooms night and day. And this, this farm was producing 2 million pounds of what you might know as the agaricus mushroom, the button mushroom. Mm. Two million pounds a year it was a very big farm. It had had uh, um, maybe thirty rooms, and each room would be producing twenty thousand pounds of mushrooms every three months. So it was a oh. constant cycle. Just to give you a, another idea of the scale of this, agaricus grows on a compost. This compost is based around 
straw. So we're composting this straw, we're breaking it down to a point where the, this mushroom can actually utilize it as food. Every week, every week we were preparing and putting into a, a new house 320 tons of compost. Per house. No, no, per, per week. So that was four houses. So 80 oh, wow. tons of compost went into every house for that particular crop. And on a 90-day cycle, what I was seeing there is, is I was actually seeing um, <clears throat> 200 crops of mushrooms um, every year. Oh, my goodness. Times, times 10 years. I saw 2,000 <laughs> crops in my 10 years there. Think about a normal farmer, Lori. I mean, it's like, what do they see? Uh, 50 One crop a year, right? Time? Yeah, exactly. Uh, 2,000 crops in those 10 years. Wow. And that was just the, the little white button mushroom? That was the button mushroom. And here was, the, here was the really cool thing about it is that we had a Japanese scientist on staff who was our research and development director, Dr. Uriyama very interesting man and he was growing shiitake mushrooms he was growing enoki taki mushrooms he was growing oyster mushrooms so i was exposed to that as well and, and you know as i was working there being very interested i became production manager after a couple of years and so i was involved in every aspect of this large farm i mean there was there was approximately 200 people working on this farm that's how large it was and and so I got to see, this is in the 70s, I got to see shiitake, uh, oyster mushroom. I got to see these mushrooms growing, and I also got to eat them. Oh, wow. So, so fresh shiitake mushrooms, I was consuming those back in the, the 70s, and, and that just opened up the whole mushroom growing world to me. Wow. Okay, so tell us the difference between like the white button mushroom, shiitake, so because these may be foreign words to some people. So what, what exactly is, how, how do you know the different variety of mushrooms? Like what's a portobello mushroom? What, how, 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 what do we know, what are we looking at? Okay, well, and, and what we're talking about really is we're talking about different mushroom species. Mm. So the agaricus is a particular species of mushrooms. It's been grown since the 1700s, started out in Europe uh, producing agaricus mushrooms in caves in France. And that's uh, the agaricus mushrooms actually called the, the uh, champignon de Paris, the mushroom of Paris. Wow. And, and so that's, that's what we've been growing in the West. But in, in Asia, they started growing shiitake mushrooms in the 12th century. Wow. The 12th okay. and shiitake mushrooms, they grow on wood. So they grow on um, the, the primary way of growing them is on an oak log, a log that they cut three feet long and it's about four feet, four inches in diameter. And they, they will, will spawn this log and the shiitake will grow off of this wood. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so shiitake is a, um, uh, it's a mushroom that is not wild here. We don't have it in North America. It's wild in Asia. They develop it into a cultivar. Oyster mushrooms we have here, but a lot of these mushrooms, the only certain mushrooms are, are easy to grow. And most of those mushrooms would be mushrooms that are growing on wood mm. or the fact of, of uh, garicus, it's something that grows uh, wild in pastures and composted materials. So, so normally, Growing a mushroom is not like growing a plant where you're you're getting uh, seeds or something. And and let me just let me just give you a brief overview of what uh, is the life cycle of this organism. Hmm. Mushrooms are not plants; they're not animals. They have a kingdom of their own right in between. And they you don't grow mushrooms with seeds. Mushrooms have spores. Hmm. So if we start with a spore, that spore uh, will land somewhere on the ground and it will germinate into a very fine filament, very fine thread-like filament. And when you have multiple filaments growing together, they will grow together and form a network called mycelium. So, so this mycelium is something that we never see out in nature uh, because it's in the ground, it's in a piece of wood, 
The mycelium is the actual, what we would call the vegetative body of this organism. And it's amassing nutrients. It's out there moving through. It's decomposing. Mushrooms are decomposers. This is what they do. Fungi are decomposers. We need, they're, they're a major part of our ecosystem out there. They're, they're creating new soils by breaking down all this organic matter. They're very important. They're working with the bacteria and the other microorganisms. So, so that mycelium and in, and in uh, Seattle, in the fall, when the temperatures drop, the rains come, all of a sudden we start to see mushrooms popping up everywhere. This is a, a trigger for that mycelial body, that fungal body that we don't see to put up a mushroom. So, so we have spore um, germinating into fine filaments, creating a mycelium, which is a network that is, is uh, gathering nutrients. And when uh, the time is right uh, in the fall, it will produce what we would call a fruiting body, which is the mushroom. And then the mushroom, as it matures, it gets to a certain stage and those gills underneath the mushroom are what produce the spores. And they will produce, one mushroom will produce billions of spores and those spores fall out they go off on the winds they find a home somewhere and if conditions are right they will in fact germinate and start this whole pro process over again so so the life cycle of that mushroom is really important and, and here's what's kind of interesting as a mushroom grower if i want to grow mushrooms i don't use spores what i do is i take that live mycelium and I bring it into sterile culture in a laboratory and I'll take that and I'll put it on a carrier material and then that's what I'll plant in my compost. So for example, mm. for, I'll sterilize a, a bottle of grain and then I'll, I'll put the mycelium on it. Again, it's all sterile because uh, otherwise this mycelium wouldn't grow. It colonizes the grain and then I'll take that grain and every single grain's got mycelium on it and I'll spread it all throughout my compost and it will grow out, take over this compost and that's just the beginning of my mushroom crop. Wow. Okay, so the mycelium, how big is the mycelium under the ground that we can't see? Well, you see, here's the thing, the, the mycelium of, of any species will grow out until it no longer has nutrients. In mm -hmm. other words, what it's doing is, is it's, it, uh, and, and you know, mushrooms, when you're hunting wild mushrooms, oftentimes they'll always come up in the same spot. Hmm. The reason they would is because that mycelium that is established there, there is a continual flow of new materials for it to consume. Sometimes it, there, there isn't, uh, it will consume the, the materials that it's uh, uh, growing on and there will be no mushrooms growing there because those those have been consumed and gone. And, and a, a perfect example of this, have you ever seen a, a fairy ring in a, in a lawn or something and you see this circle and it's a circle of mushrooms. Mm -hmm. And what's happened there is that mycelium has started from a center and it grows out in a radial way. And where the mushrooms form is right on the very periphery where the fresh growing tips are. Hmm. Uh, so, so if it, in other words, so that mycelium, if, if it has like a clear uh, soccer field, yeah, it can grow out in a radial way. But think about a mycelium in a forest. In a forest, it's it's going, it's got all sorts of obstacles, right? right. So, so it will grow until it either runs out of new food or until it hits something and that physically stops it from continuing to grow. And remember too, there are, there are thousands of different fungal species in the ground that it is growing with. So all of these different fungal species and mushroom species are growing, their mycelium is spreading, and, and they do not, when they, when they hit each other, when they find each other, there's a zone of inhibition because they're different species. These species do not come together and fuse or anything like that. It's a different species. If it did fuse, then we'd say, okay, this is probably the same species or a species that is very close to this particular uh, fungus, but mm -hmm. they don't. 
So, so that could even stop them. They could get out to an area and it's filled with some other species and they might get to there and it's just like, that's as far as I can go. So you can think of the actual mushroom that we eat as like the fruit? You can, you can think about it as the fruit. And I just had this whole thought this morning. I thought, okay, what is a mushroom? Is it a fruit or is it a vegetable? <laughs> <laughs> it's a fungus among us. Yeah, exactly. I'm well, sure you use that one. In a sense, among us is, is true because in a sense, it's like we've got plants over here. We've got animals over here. And it's right in between the two. And, and so, so really, it's, it's neither. That's the answer, right? But I like right. to think of a mushroom as a, uh, as a vegetable. You know, uh -huh. I think of fruits as kind of sweet, and, and uh, uh, right. whereas vegetables can be kind of the full range there. So I think of a mushroom more of like, you know, you go into the, the store and it's in the vegetable section. True. Of, Absolutely you know. true. So all mushrooms have the same cycle life cycle pretty much when we're talking about this particular group of mushrooms because there are multiple divisions of fungi and mm. fungi uh, cover a very very large territory there's actually fungi that have this mycelial stage but they never produce what we would call a fruiting body mm. okay. they're called imperfect fungi whereas mushrooms and and that classification is called a perfect fungus so so okay. that perfect fungus group will produce a fruiting body will produce a mushroom and, and you know not all mushrooms are classical either right i right. mean not every one of them has a stem and a cap there are really odd mushrooms out there too right uh, and we would look at them and, and some of them would look like it would look like coral huh so you'd have uh, these different mushrooms that are actually just, that's how they manifest as a, a coral. Hmm. And you're going, wow, that is really, or, or some of them are just a little almost blade like grass and they hmm. grow on all sorts of different materials. Some, some grow on insects. So a, a dead insect and they will like cordyceps. I don't know if you heard of cordyceps, but cordyceps, grows on various types of insects, multiple species of cordyceps. Isn't there, is there one that kills like the insect or something? Like <laughs> I saw some video and something was like growing through a dead insect or something. Okay, you know, this is interesting because I, I know what you're talking about. And I actually went back and pulled up that video because what the video was about, it was, it's got a sensationalized a bit because it caught, talked about zombie ants yes yes yeah it was ants yes <laughs> what is that because i don't want that <laughs> <laughs> well well that is a species of cordyceps and oh. and it infects i mean all these different species infect a specific insect and in this case it infected the ant and then the ant crawled away and then finally dropped at a certain point and the cordyceps is feeding on this Ant, and then at a certain point, again, like we're talking about classical mushrooms, when, when the conditions are right, that fruiting body will come up. And, and in that video, it just sort of like poked itself right out of the head of this right. insect. And, and so the thing is, is they called it, they said the way they presented it was that the cordyceps infected it, turned it into a zombie, and then it, and then, then it told this ant to climb up to the top to where it could spread its spores further. Well, it's interesting because the article that came out later that was actual science disproved that completely and said, look, it doesn't go to the brain because what they were saying originally was it takes over the brain of this ant and, right. and it controls it like a zombie. No, no, that wasn't what was happening. They said, actually, actually, when we examined the ant, the fungus never made it to the brain. Oh, <laughs> so wow. It actually had infected it and the, the ants... Um, nervous system allowed it to still function and its limbs and everything were active and it just, it just climbed up the top of this for who knows what reason you know you know how it right. is Lori we sometimes look at everything from human eyes and mm -hmm. we create a narrative about that mm -hmm. plus it's really it's kind of fun to think about zombie ants well well <laughs> 
<laughs> well, well, you know what? Look at all the look at all the TV shows and movies about zombies, right? I mean, right. I sometimes think, you know, what what are they telling us? We've got so many things with zombies right now, and and I sort of say to people, you see all those people out there with their their phones and they're walking along and they've got their they're doing this with their phone, and I go, that is the zombie apocalypse. Mm -hmm. You are exactly right. I can't wait to put on the intro. We even talk about zombie ants. <laughs> this is going to be fabulous. Oh my goodness. So let's get it though into the mushrooms and the medicinal component. You, you know, using mushrooms as, you know, food, not only as food, uh, but the medicine component. So that's kind of your specialty, correct? Well, it is my specialty. And, and, you know, if you don't mind, before I get there, let me, let yeah. me just say a few things about the nutritional value of mushrooms. Oh, please. Here's what's really interesting is that in the 70s, you know, I'm working on the mushroom farm and they're doing their best to educate people to the nutritional value of mushrooms. And, and the problem they're having is that classically trained nutritionists are saying mushrooms really have no nutritional value. They're, they're just pretty much a tasteful flavoring or a garnish or something. The reason they said that was because mushrooms are very low in calories. Mm -hmm. and, and it's like, if this food has no calories, what's the point, right? Mm -hmm. The fact is, is that, is that mushrooms are, are high in protein. They're probably one of the highest in a vegetable. They have a great amino acid uh, composite, uh, really good profile of amino acids. They're high in carbohydrates and, and the carbohydrate side of it, they have carbohydrates that are really positive carbohydrates like mannitol, which is very slow acting carbohydrate. It's not, it doesn't have, you know, it doesn't, you know, like sugar or anything. No, it's very slow acting. And they have something called a beta glucan, which makes up their cell walls. And the beta glucans, all mushrooms, 50% of their cell wall approximately with mushrooms is made up of beta glucans. And it's the beta glucans that are the immunologically active compounds. And that's mm. what's so interesting about it because, you know, and, and in my business, what I've done is I, I, I've looked at the whole range of mushrooms out there. And in China, they have a book, 270 different mushrooms, they say are medicinal. Wow. And I'm like, oh my God. Okay. However, some have been used in traditional Chinese medicine in a regular way. So then you sort of go, okay, which ones are the ones that science has told us and, and your medical system has told us are the ones that are the most active because what am I supposed to do? 270 different mushrooms. How, how do I deal mm -hmm. with that? Mm -hmm. So, so really then you look at the uh, top, let's just say the top 10 that scientists have, have done a lot of in vitro and e in vivo testing with. And, and what, what you find is that the difference between all these different medicinal mushrooms and mushrooms generally in terms of their, their immunological activity is the structure of the beta-glucan. So the beta-glucan structure varies just a little bit. And that variability is what makes one, one uh, particular mushroom uh, super active and another not. It makes a, one particular mushroom that is maybe works really well in this particular cancer system or against this particular cancer and another one working against another one, another different mm -hmm. cancer system. So, so it is the actual architecture of that beta glucan that makes for the activity and even the specific activity of the mushroom. So, so mm -hmm. here's what's really, really interesting about it is that we can eat mushrooms and we can get those benefits just from eating mushrooms. Mm -hmm. So, so what I, what I always tell people is look, even before you start to supplement, even before you look at mushrooms from a medicinal standpoint, put mushrooms into your diet. They're a wonderful food. One of the things about the, about the um, protein and the carbohydrate in a mushroom is that mushroom cell walls are also made up of something called chitin and chitin is a structural, type of carbohydrate and we do not digest it well. And so it locks up some of those nutrients in the mushroom. And, and what that means is that mushrooms end up being very high in fiber. Hmm. Well, fiber is good. Fiber feeds our microbiome. So, mm -hmm. so here we have a high fiber food. 
it's got uh, medicinally active beta glucans and other compounds in it, and and it's readily available. And so, let's put it into our diet. Let's make it part of our diet. And and it's very very tasty as well. I don't know about you, but I love the taste of mushrooms. I guess I, guess I would you hope might. so. <laughs> uh, I uh, and and. Again, like I was telling you, I was very fortunate to be exposed to shiitake mushrooms in the 70s. And and here's this kind of a funny thing about that was that on this farm, you know, we have a marketing director and he put together this amazing marketing campaign that he's going to, because we were starting to grow reasonable amounts of shiitake mushrooms. Right. And so he put together a marketing campaign and, and he, uh, you know, we're getting ready to launch this marketing and he launches it and he gets them out into the stores with all the other mushrooms. and after a period of, I don't know, a few months, the whole thing just flopped. People weren't buying them. Hmm. And, and why? Well, it kind of got back to the point that people felt like shiitake was too strong a flavor. Oh. And, and I don't know, you know, a lot of people, a lot of people I talk to say, oh yeah, the, the button mushroom is really bland. I don't think it's bland, but for some people, they say, oh, it's very bland. I, I still love the flavor. I think it's very flavorful, but shiitake. Do you, do you eat shiitake? I've had shiitake, yes. Oh, man. You know what? In China, in China, the name for shiitake is fragrant mushroom. Mm. It has got a wonderful odor, a wonderful flavor. It's my favorite mushroom. It's delicious. Uh, I, if ever I see shiitake <laughs> when I'm at my natural food store shopping, and they sometimes have it. They don't always have it. I just get the bag and I just dive in and I just start grabbing handfuls. <laughs> <laughs> now that does bring up to a point. Are there any mushrooms that should be cooked before eaten for any reason? Well, you know what? The um, I think you're better off cooking mushrooms generally because what that helps to do is break down the cell walls. It breaks down the chitin. Mm. It makes the mushroom a little more bioavailable. Some people have said don't eat the agaricus and and... One of the reasons is that agaricus does have a particular compound in it that is a mutagen, but in very, very small quantities. And when you cook the agaricus, that pretty much destroys that compound completely. So mm -hmm. there's no safety issues there with, with it. And so no, uh, but in terms of eating them raw, look, if you eat mushrooms raw, like especially the button mushroom or something, you eat it raw, I don't know, a couple times a month or something. It's like, no, it's not going right. to have be no harmful effects from anything. What's the name of the mutagen? I can't recall the name. Well, it's called uh, um, um, agaritine, and it is a hydrazine agaritine. compound. Okay. And hydrazine compounds in, in sufficient quantity can be very dangerous, but it occurs in a very small amount. And, and again, it's called agaritine, which is interesting because that specific hydrazine compound the, the, um, they named it after the genus because the genus for the button mushroom is agaricus. Hmm. So, so not just that, but even the wild agaricus will have some of this compound in there. But okay. generally speaking, and I would say don't worry about this being a problem at all. And Because and even steaming, right, will work to break it down? Um, or does it need to be cooked? I, well, you know what? I, I don't know specifically about that but what i would say is that um boy i've never i've never steamed my mushrooms if i want to eat them but maybe mm -hmm. you know they use steam for some other purpose but but no i i you know saute I, them or things well yes and 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 again what i would say too and what i tell people is is use a hot pan you know mm. have you ever heard people say oh yeah mushrooms i hate them they're slimy they're you know the texture is just no good and i'm mm -hmm. like you haven't cooked them right you have to cook them in a hot pan you okay. Throw them in and with your favorite oil, whatever you want to use for for frying, and if you if you use oils at all, and then you you cook them up. That if you if you do that, you'll kind of sear them. The moisture will stay in, rather than if if you cook it on a low heat. What happens? The moisture all comes right out of the mushroom. Hmm. Then those mushrooms are sitting in a in a puddle of water. Hmm. So and, can you can you use things like vegetable broth or water even to do that? Like like a hot. Well, well, I, I think you pro you probably could. Yeah, certainly you could. I mean, you could cook them that way. I mean, I mean, that ultimately means you've got maybe more of a soup or something. Hmm. Um, but I, I don't know. I've never cooked with water, but I just uh, um, spoke to somebody who 
wasn't using oils and and that's what they were doing they were cooking frying in water i thought oh that's really interesting i've never really thought about that before yeah a lot of my um patients we use no oil just because they're it's it's high in calories there's not much nutritional value and so we try to stay away from it but we do water sauteing and that's what i've done with mushrooms and it seems okay, to okay 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 well, so you know, but just a little bit it's just enough to to wet the surface keep, that doesn't stick. yeah and, and you know what I, I thought to myself too i thought you know what you could always cook them in in, in a, a coated pan i don't use coated pans but non-stick mm -hmm. pans and then you can mm -hmm. cook them i like to brown them on on mm. both sides and that kind of caramelizes them a little bit and gives them a little extra flavor but mm -hmm. that's that's what i tell people is look cook them on a high heat so that they gotcha. they don't lose all of their water or they don't become sort of a little bit slimy gotcha so then what would be some of the more common things that people can use and say hey i'm eating this to treat this or to aid in my in you know prevention of this like what are some of the medicinal qualities of the mushrooms that you can find in american stores and american grocery stores well you know the all of the research for the most part with with mushrooms has been devoted to um, immunological issues and that would that would get right down to um, you know all, so much research is is uh, looking for anything that fights cancer right Right. So, so, so much of what's happened in Asia and, and the really best research has taken place in Japan. The Japanese have been, been researching the medicinal properties of mushrooms since the 1960s and 1970s. So they've got a lot of really solid research that's well done by high quality scientists. And, and what happens is, is the, the mushrooms will actually modulate and stimulate immune cells, whether it be macrophages, or natural killer cells. So that's, that's, that's pretty much how they function. They will, we actually have a receptor for beta glucans. So mm -hmm. when we consume something that's got beta glucans, the receptor is down in our intestine. And that's something where these beta glucans will go down there. They will hit that receptor site and that will, will stimulate the production of the different immunological cells. And so that's really mm -hmm. as much as anything else, I would say that's the key um, um, effect of mushrooms and what really you should be looking for. For example, they've developed mushrooms into uh, drugs. Even in, in Japan, there's a mushroom that they developed into a, a cancer drug, not to be used alone, but they use it in conjunction with traditional therapies like uh, uh, radiation and chemotherapy. You will take this along with it just to try and help your immune system from getting completely wrecked to mm -hmm. help your immune system be a little more competent. So they've developed a drug in uh, Japan. They've developed a, a drug for mushrooms in China. And, and you know, with natural products, what, what uh, scientists generally do and where we find out about the activity of natural products is they will take a natural product and they will fractionate it. They will extract it. They will fractionate it into multiple fractions. Uh, and then they'll test each fraction to see what has activity and they'll put it against certain, certain types of, in this case, tumor systems, maybe a, a system for, a, um, well, they have sarcoma 180 is a major one that they use for a lot of the tests. That's, a, that's kind of like an entry level system, but other systems, and then they'll report out the uh, percentage of inhibition of hmm. the different uh, uh, cells that they've been using. And, and in some cases they get uh, complete inhibition uh, some cases it'll be 80% or 50% or so. So there's a lot of research around that aspect of it. And, and you know, some of the mushrooms have been used as traditional cancer agents <clears throat> um, in traditional cultures. They've been used, <clears throat> but I, you know, and, and, you know, one thing I want to be very clear about is that there's, there's, always anecdotal information out, out there about natural products. And you, you have to be really careful because I don't look at these and say, yeah, mushrooms, this mushroom, that one's going to cure this or cure that. I, mm -hmm. I absolutely do not like that kind of talk. I really think it's important that it's all kept into to, in perspective because as you know, you can go out on the internet and you can find sites that are touting products, including mushrooms for doing mm -hmm. just about everything you can imagine, mm -hmm. you know, the whole thing mm -hmm. of a, a panacea. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm, I, I 
I really discourage people from thinking like that. This is, this is something that, again, this gets back to uh, food as medicine. Mm -hmm. And this gets back to putting mushrooms into your diet as part of your, you know, of feeding yourself properly and feeding yourself foods that not only are nutritious and feed mm -hmm. you on that level, but also are helping you when it comes to disease. And, mm -hmm. and you know, if we are eating well, that goes a long way to keeping us healthy. Mm -hmm. you know, of course, there are other things like exercise and lifestyle and things mm -hmm. like that. But, but our diet, that is the keystone to being a healthy human. And there's so many things out there. I mean, my God, I walk into a supermarket and I'm just like, I, I'm like this. I don't want to see all that stuff in the middle aisles because mm -hmm. it's just, I, I just think of it as non-food, a lot of it and mm -hmm. nothing but something that is going to do a person a detriment. Mm -hmm. hey, I call them Franken foods. Oh mm -hmm. my God. And, and, and that's, mm -hmm. that's where eating fresh fruit and fresh vegetables and, and, meat that's done in the right way. I mean, that's where it's all so very important. And, and that's why, again, the whole idea of food is medicine. And you know what, in Asia, this is a very strong concept that they developed years and years and years ago. In fact, mm -hmm. in fact, it's funny because I've even gone to Asian restaurants in China where, where the everything that they're feeding you, everything on the menu is considered to be a medicine. Wow. <laughs> so, so, wow. I mean, uh, uh, because, you know, let's face it, even, even you know, their food, a lot of it may not be the best for you in some way. Right. Uh, but that, they, they have those types of restaurants over there. So you order per your disease. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have a gallbladder. I will have a... <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. Or maybe maybe they give you, they have somebody there that as you come in, they'll they'll basically... Read your pulses and pulse, say, hey. Exactly. And look at your eye and then go, okay. There you go. Yeah. But that's, you know, that's one of the reasons we're launching our journal um, because we want to put the science to the food. And so, so people can feel encouraged by that. And nutritional science is difficult, right? Cause you just talked about breaking the food down into components, but it's an orchestra effect, right? So we have, you know, the violins and we have the, you know, the cello and we have the, you know, the flutes and the, the percussion and they work together to create the music of health, right? So it's hard when you start pulling out the individual parts to really understand the power of them together. And I think that's lost in the science, but I understand that's, that's where we're at. It's a very reductionist view though. So it can it be is, difficult. It is. Yes, yeah. that's absolutely right. Because, because it is all, it's, it's like an ecology, isn't mm -hmm. it? It's like even yes. looking at nature and saying, Oh, this one item out there is so important to nature. It's like right. everybody out there, you know, and I look at nature as, as um, kind of like you're talking, it's a symphony. It's mm -hmm. all of these different organisms that are working together and they're singing a song. Sometimes, sometimes something happens and, and something gets a little bit out of balance, but, but it's always trying to come back into balance. And I think that's even like our health. Mm -hmm. our health is something where we get sick when all of a sudden we're out of balance. And, mm -hmm. and what we're trying to do is we're trying to get back up to that homeostasis. We mm -hmm. want to get back to a balanced position. Right. And the only, honestly, and trust me, I'm a traditionally trained MD, but once I discovered the value of nutrition, right? Like you described the key, the keystone or the cornerstone, the foundation of our health, I've never had more success in helping people either reverse chronic disease or greatly improve it than moving towards what you're describing is whole food, plant foods, the, 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 the getting back to nature type foods. And so to that point, if you could only have one mushroom on your plate, <laughs> what mushroom would you eat? Oh, I, I, there's no question in my mind it would be shiitake mushroom. <laughs> <laughs> all right, shiitake mushrooms it is. And why, why the shiitake? Well, again, first of all, it's, um, it's a meaty mushroom. It's, mm. it's not super big, but it, it is solid and, and meaty. The flavor is, is out of this world. The, the, the odor, when I, when I'm on a shiitake farm, the odor of shiitake, because there's, there's millions of mushrooms growing. It's a big farm, millions of mushrooms. And the odor in the air, the fragrance of the air is, 
overwhelming and it's wow. just so delightful and, and very few mushrooms will have that kind of power um so shiitake to me um just the the flavor and and again uh, it's that's for me the ultimate and so whenever i see shiitake i'm always you know i i, I eat mushrooms three or four five times a week mm-hmm. they get into my dinners some way because they're they're very versatile you can use them in so many different ways what's your favorite um recipe to use the shiitake Oh boy, you know what? I, I don't have any actual recipes, but what I, I do with mushrooms generally is, is uh, I love making stir fries. Mm. So I'll make up a stir fry. They'll always have a major mushroom component in there. I mean, you can take uh, shiitake or mushrooms and you can, you can uh, uh, fry them up with your eggs. Um, I, when I eat eggs, I like to you know, chop and throw all sorts of stuff in there. Right? <laughs> I would say tofu. <laughs> <laughs> And so, so there's just a lot, uh, you know, for me, it's just very versatile mm. food that, that you can do a lot with. So, so, you know, and, and there's, there's some great recipe books out there too. Great mushroom mm-hmm. recipe books. And, you know, give oh, any wow. books anymore. I don't know. You could go on the net and find recipes. Yeah. I just Google mushroom <laughs> recipes. I know. That, that's incredible. So where do you feel like the mushrooms are now? Like what is the landscape in the future? Do you feel like this is a growing entity or do you still feel like we're kind of stagnant, we're underappreciated type of market? You know what? Um, you know, I, I started as a mushroom grower in 1973. You know, and for most people, that's like before most people I talked to were born. I was born before 73. <laughs> Not much, but I Not was. Much. No, I, I know because I know how old you are. I listen to you. <laughs> no, so, so, you know, uh, um, and <clears throat> I've known all along what a wonderful thing they were. Mm-hmm. And, and you can imagine, I started my business, my, uh, Namex, uh, which, which sells medicinal mushroom extracts to the supplement industry. And and literally, Lori, I, I was walking around like they have these big expos, trade shows, Natural Foods Expo. And, and I was walking around the first couple of years there with this mushroom in my hand. It's a reishi mushroom. Reishi mushroom is, is like wood. <laughs> it's a beautiful, beautiful red mushroom that has kind of a ram's head shape to it. And, and it's one of the most famous and highly revered mushrooms in all of Asia, I'd be walking around the floor there with this mushroom in my hand. I'd be trying to get companies to put mushrooms into their line of herbal products because they're mostly selling green herbs. They're selling echinacea, ginseng, ginkgo, all these other herbs. Nobody's got a mushroom product. It's 1989. Nobody has a Mm. mushroom product. And I'm trying to introduce these into their product line. Wow. So, So it took decades of education, of articles, of books, of me getting out and, and for mushrooms to even be accepted uh, in, uh, in supplement circles. And, and then, of course, mushrooms, uh, there's more and more mushrooms being grown in North America. There's a lot now. We have uh, maybe six or eight different mushrooms that, to choose from if we're in the right place. Like Seattle, you can right. get six or eight different mushrooms. You go to a Whole Foods or, your, or a Puget Sound Consumer Co-op, something like that. They'll have different mushrooms there, which is something we didn't have really back in the 70s or even the 80s. So, <clears throat> so <clears throat> um, the, I, I've been there sort of from the beginning watching this go. Right now, you probably know this, mushrooms are just like trending. Mm-hmm. They, every time you turn around, there's another article about mushrooms. There's, mm-hmm. and, and people, people, our customers will use mushrooms in chocolates. They'll use, they, everybody wants to put mushrooms with coffee, like a reishi coffee. Uh, so, so the different innovative ways people are now coming up with drinks, there's drinks now that have mushrooms in them. I mean, it is just the, the uses of mushrooms has just exploded and wow. our business has just exploded in the last three years. It's just gone crazy. We can hardly keep up to the demand. It's just, it's just crazy. And, and, and I, I think it's wonderful because th- this is just something we've been missing in North America and, uh, and, you know, in Europe, of course, they, they've been on to different wild mushrooms and mushrooms in general for a long time. Asia has, we're the missing link and mushrooms are the missing link in, in a sense, in terms of wow. foods. Mushrooms are kind of that missing link that people 
need to start looking at. And and hopefully the price of them will come. Agaricus is, is quite cheap. The other mm. mushrooms are a little more expensive. But, you know, a bag of shiitake mushrooms, fresh shiitake mushrooms, you buy that, you get a lot of mushrooms in that bag for, you know, three, four dollars or something mm -hmm. like that. You get a lot of mushrooms. So, so it's not out of the question to be buying them at all. So in your company, do you have a, a mushroom farm then? Or do you you buy wholesale from like how does your company work like what do you do well, exactly well here here's what's really interesting about it is that is that um <clears throat> in north america i can grow mushrooms and i can sell them for food use mm -hmm. i can sell them fresh but remember a mushroom like a vegetable is 90 percent water hmm. now if i get five dollars for that pound of fresh mushrooms i have to get fifty dollars for that pound of dried mushrooms because supplements are all sold dried. Oh, wow. The, so, so this is what's interesting. The economics do not work. In 1989, I took my first trip to China and I spent the whole 90s traveling throughout China. China's the, uh, right now, they grow 85% of the world's mushrooms. 85% huh. of the world's mushrooms. So, so the issue is that you cannot, nobody, can grow mushrooms in the United States and sell them as a supplement. So, so I went to China in the 90s. I knew this because I'm a mushroom grower. I, I know the economics of it. So I went to China and and you know I was just so amazed at how wonderful they they literally have hundreds of thousands of small mushroom growers over there, and they have research institutes. I went over to conferences. I visited factories. Oh, wow. I spent all the nights in 1997, Lori, I took uh, OCIA, which was a very big organic certifier from the United States to China. We did the very first mushroom workshop for organic production in China, wow. 1997. Wow. And, and, and so now we have, we get all of our mushrooms, we contract with growers over there and, and I have, um, manufacturing partners that will make the extracts for me that's where all of our products come from and they're certified by german certifiers and before they leave china we have to test them for everything i mean sure. you know let's face it like any food and 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 in in this industry uh believe me i mean nutritional supplements you can go yeah there are a lot of things out there that are not very high quality mm -hmm. but but one of the things that everything has to pass it has to be has to pass uh, heavy metals regulation Mm -hmm. pesticide regulations, microbiological regulations. I can't sell my products unless they pass. So before they even come out of China, we're testing them. And then once they get over here to North America, we're testing them again. So they get tested twice before wow. we even release them for sale. Wow. So, so th uh, that's what we're doing in terms of uh, selling our product for supplement use. And, and, but what you, what, what, you know, one of the things that I do and, and what I've done a lot of and what I believe in is I believe in testing, testing, mm. testing. So we test all our products for the active compounds. And unfortunately, what has happened in the United States is a lot of people who can't produce mushrooms are now producing the mycelium, but they're mm. growing the mycelium on grain. Kind of what I talked to you, what we use as seed as a mushroom grower. They're growing it on the grain and then they're harvesting the whole thing once the mycelium has colonized the grain. They're drying it out. They're turning it into a powder. Then they're selling it and calling it mushroom. Hmm. So you could go out to the store, even, even uh, um, PCC or Whole Foods, and half the products on the market there will be, will be mostly myceliated grain. And you're wanting the actual fruiting body. Yes, because because what happens is is that's where the beta glycan is. There, there's nothing wrong with the mycelium. The mycelium has the beta glucans. It's still got medicinal compounds. But the mm. problem is is that they don't separate the grain out from the mycelium. Are you oh. familiar with a product called tempeh? Yeah, I eat tempeh a lot. Well, yeah. Do you, <laughs> so do you know what tempeh is? Yeah, it's just fermented soybean. Okay. Do you know what it's fermented with? No. A, a fungus. <laughs> that, that I love that, tempeh. It's one of my favorite foods. <laughs> well, believe it or not, that fermentation that uh, is a uh, mycelium on there. That white ah. stuff. Tempeh. Oh, really? That That's a mycelium. Fungal mycelium. So you're eating mycelium. Fascinating. Okay, so you're eating mycelium that has colonized those cooked 
soybeans right. and turned it into this kind of white cake, yes. which you slice up and you cook in different ways. Tempeh right. is a wonderful food. Oh, but, yes. but now think about that tempeh for a minute now. Are those soybeans gone and it's just mycelium or the soybeans are a big part of the product, right? Right. Yeah, absolutely. Well, this is what people are growing in North America, except they will take it and they'll dry it, grind it to a powder mm. and call it mushroom and sell it as a supplement. But they're getting, they're mostly grain. They're getting mostly grain. Oh, wow. Fascinating. And, and, and not only that, this is some of the major producers of these supplements, the companies that should know better, companies that are doing this, they are producing mycelium and not in, in China they produce a lot of mycelium for medicinal use, but they, they do it in big vats of liquid and it's and it's called liquid fermentation. And then they can drain off the liquid and they have pure mycelium and then they sell that. Great, no problem. But what they do over here is they don't separate the mycelium from the, the grain. grain. And the worst oh, part wow. about it is when they sell it, you look at the label and on the label, it says shiitake mushroom and it shows a picture of shiitake mushroom, but it's actually myceliated grain. It's that tempeh oh, wow. you eat fresh that's been dried out and ground to a powder and using shiitake mycelium or reishi mycelium or some other mushroom mycelium. It is... You know, people think they're getting a mushroom supplement. They're not. And, and mm. this, this is the big problem. And this is something that happens at times in the supplement industry and lots of industries. There's, there's this kind right. of thing going on. So, so that's, that's a huge issue. And, and I did a big study on this, Laurie. I, I did a study that I published in 1985 or 19, uh, 2015. Sorry, it's called Redefining Medicinal Mushrooms, where we tested 95 products wow. we tested dried mushrooms we bought 40 of these myceliated grain products off the internet we tested them all for beta glucans and what's called alpha glucan alpha glucan is is starch mushrooms do not have starch mm -hmm. Here, here's kind of an interesting fact mushrooms produce glycogen really that's their storage carbohydrate, glycogen. Just like us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, plants produce starch, mushrooms produce glycogen. So, so, but in, in very small amounts. So when you test the products out there, what you find is mushrooms are 25 to 50% beta glucan. The alpha glucan, which is the starch or glycogen, mushrooms are generally below 5%. They don't produce a lot. Um, then you look at these products where they're producing the myceliated grain and the beta glucan level is down about 5%. Oh, because, wow. Because the, the issue is, it's just like if you look at your tempeh, you look at that and you look at the amount of soy in there. And, and not only that, when you dry that tempeh out, dry it out sometime and that mycelium is just going to dry out to nothing. Right. You know, a lot of soy there. So. Right. so the, these products are 5% beta-glucan, and they're 30 to 60% starch. Mm, yeah, oh, my goodness. That they're grown on. Do you have a, a, a list somewhere of the suppliers of medicinal supplements that you believe are? You know what? I, 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 I really don't do that. To stay out of it. Yeah, because, you know, what I'm doing is I'm just trying to alert people to a category of product. What I would say, it's very, very simple. There's two ways to unmask these products. One, if they are made in the U.S., they are mm. myceliated grain, because what I'm telling mm. you about the economics. The other thing is, which is, which is really fun, is take one of those products, empty the capsules out, like two or three capsules, empty them out into a quarter cup of water, stir it up really good, get some iodine, put 10 drops of iodine in there. There's what's called the iodine starch test. If there is starch in there, which comes from the grain, that product will turn black. Now take a regular mushroom, which has no starch, and take it, powder it up, do the same thing, put the iodine in. All you see is the color of the iodine. There's no starch in the mushroom. How fascinating. So this is a simple test that people can do. If you're taking a mushroom product right now and you don't know, again, I'm saying these products are made in the United States. So if they say made in the U.S., you pretty much know. Mm. Uh, but you can also do this iodine test, which is really cool. 
Yeah, that is cool. That's really yeah, helpful. It's, it's yes, and it just unmasks them completely. And so, so this this is this is something that for me, uh, very few people out there talk about the quality. So you can say, oh yeah, go out, my friends, and get a medicinal mushroom product. It's really great. And they go out into the store and they look on the shelf and they they pick the one that the clerk tells them is the best one, or they look at a label right. and they think, oh, this label's great, or. So I do have a question. So are the medis the mushroom extracts as as good as eating the pure mushroom itself? Do you, are well, they bioactively co comparable? Well, uh, for example, extracts can be made a lot of different ways. Some some herbs they will try to build up some particular medicinal part of that of that herb. What we do with all of our extracts is we try to maintain the exact profile of that mushroom. So I what see. we what we want to do because what you have to remember is a supplement. If you're telling somebody to take two 500 milligram capsules, that's not very much. Mm. And so if you just have a ground up powder. Think about that for a minute. In in um, a one gram that of a, of a mushroom, one gram of dried mushroom powder. That's that's just 10 grams of a fresh mushroom. I mm. weighed up a medium sized agaricus mushroom the other day. Because I'm like, huh, I, I, let's just find out. I put this on the scale. It weighed 40 grams. Oh, my goodness. Oh. One medium-sized agaricus weighed 40 grams. Hmm. And when I tell people I can sit down and eat half a pound of mushrooms, I was like, well, no problem. That's only six or seven mushrooms. Dense. Dense. I can do that in my sleep. Wow. Um, so so, so the, the, the thing is, is that what you have to do with a lot of herbal products to get enough of the actives there is you have to concentrate it. So you'll take, let's say, we will take eight kilos of dried mushroom and concentrate it down into one kilo of extract powder. And mm -hmm. what we're trying to do is we're trying to not lose anything during that extraction. We don't want to throw away anything there. Um, what happens, of course, is, is eight kilos, you, you have to get rid of the fiber. So we cook it two or three times to be able to be sure that we're getting everything out of that fiber. So when we throw that fiber away, we want to know that we've gotten everything out of it. And then we, mm -hmm. then we will test it. We will see the levels of our beta-glucans. We'll test it for ergosterol. We'll test it for ergothionine. So we'll test it for a number of the actives in there. And that's the difference between what my company does and all of these other companies do. And that is that we test for the active compounds. So at the very least, we can guarantee to our customers that A, we've done, we've done, for example, ID testing. So we've done DNA. So you can know that this is in fact what we say it is. And number two, we're, we've done testing of the active compound, so you know you're actually getting what you're supposed to be getting. You're, right. I mean, the beta-glucans, for example, every single batch that we make, we test for beta-glucans because that is the most important medicinal compound in mushrooms. So we want to guarantee to our customers that they are there, they are present, they're there in the amount that they should be. Do you have a list of on your website of suppliers that you give to or you sell to? Um, you know what, I, I could certainly send you the, you know, it's funny because <laughs> it's, it's really kind of funny. Some of our customers actually put on their websites, we get our mushrooms from Namex. <laughs> Others of our customers, they don't want anybody to know because they you don't, don't want to compete want competitor to know <laughs> where they get the products. So, oh so, my gosh, that's you know, hilarious. And so because of that, we don't have a page where it's like, here's all the companies we sell to because some companies simply don't want us to do that. So the competitors can't be, oh, that's funny. And, and, and you know, what I would say is, is that now what's happened because of my, I, I wrote a white paper study that did all these tests because of my study um, and because of getting that information out to people. Um, now, a lot of companies, when they put the product out, they will say right on their packaging, they will say, no mycelium, mm -hmm. no grain, right. no starch. Interesting. This is very fascinating. Oh my goodness. Uh, well, and, and like I said, 
if, if you were unaware of this, and, and look, most people are, they would right. go to that store and the clerk would be there. And, and a lot of times these companies will come around and they'll do educational um, uh, talks to the clerks right. in these stores and they will right. just point to the product that somebody has talked to them about. And they may not know anything about mushrooms at all or anything about the quality. And that's the problem with the supplement industry in general, in my opinion, is that is that everybody kind of knows what a certain supplement, okay, I know what vitamin C is going to do. I know what vitamin mm -hmm. is good mm -hmm. for. I know, you know what these things are good for, but then you go to buy one and what do you buy? There, there's so many different brands, you know, in a sense, yeah. in a sense, you know how it is. Isn't it great to have choice, but at the same time, it's like, do we need uh, 20 different types of salt in our market? Right, right. Well, the same thing occurs like over the counter medications for cold and flu, for allergy. It's, 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 it's to, I tell people simple ingredients, stay down, look at your, <laughs> they usually, yeah, would, that's one of the main questions of what do I take? I was like, well, let's sit down and think about it. Um, well, exactly. And that's why, of course, you asked me, can you tell me these brands? And I, I can send you, you know, and I can cool. tell you a couple others. And, and also, you know, we also have a, a retail brand that oh. we just sell on the internet. I'll, I'll send you the link to that. Please, please. I, I'm going to send you a, a gift certificate too sweet <laughs> so you can try them out because yeah i really like you to try them out because you know what's interesting about it is that like when i'm talking about all these other what i call a uh, tempeh products they all taste the same they taste bland they taste a little bit like grains mm. they, sometimes the mushroom that's supposed to be bitter will taste a little bit sweet in these products mm. so so, wow. so and what i what i tell people is look every mushroom that we sell every every mushroom out there has got a unique flavor right so so when you're looking at these products taste it does it taste like a shiitake does mm. it taste mushroomy right if it doesn't if it tastes bland if it tastes like like flour of some sort you know that's what it is it's not actually mushroom despite what the label is saying interesting Wow, this has been a great conversation. Thank you. <laughs> but I really, I think it's, you know, it's a very important thing that you're, you're pointing out. I mean, these are things that we just don't know because we're not specialists in mushroom growth. I mean, no doctor I know of will know any of this information. So uh, I, I think, I think it's fabulous. And you're like the mushroom, like <laughs> you're the, the guru. So this is fabulous. Well, I've talked to physicians. I've talked to naturopaths, clinical herbalists, and, a lot of people really don't have a clue because mushrooms, again, are the missing link. Right. <laughs> They're in between sort of animals and plants. And, and when you get out there into natural products, we're talking really mostly about plants, right? Right, right. And so there's a Absolutely. lot of botanists out there, very few mycologists. And even the mycologists that are out there, they're not working necessarily in industry. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Just a funny quick story. I once... Uh, back in the 80s I, I, or 90s, early 90s, when I was traveling to China, went over there and I was bringing back a bunch of samples of these really odd mushrooms, like reishi mushrooms and stuff. And I fly back into Seattle and I'm going through customs. And I can only imagine. And, and, and the guy just looks at it and he's like, okay, over there. <laughs> <laughs> so I go over there and, and he says, we're going to bring so-and-so out who's the expert. And I'm thinking, oh my God. And out comes this man who was actually the teaching assistant in my mycology class. And oh. he said, oh, hello, Jeff. How are you doing? That's hilarious. <laughs> oh, look, you've got some, wow, beautiful Ganoderma there. <laughs> you lucked out. That's fabulous. Oh, how funny. He just happens to be in customs. How well, and that was kind of like, what do you do as a mycologist? You go to work for customs. <laughs> oh, wow. That is so weird. Isn't that, isn't that interesting? Here it Who would have ever unless thought? Unless you want to be a teacher, go on and teach. And he had a PhD right. in mycology. Again, he was the main teaching wow. assistant for my professor at wow. university. That's and, so and he funny. And ended up working for the customs department. And there he was. I hadn't seen him in... 20 plus years. Oh, wow. 
Amazing. Well, that was a reunion meant to be. <laughs> it was. <laughs> oh my goodness. Well, I hate to keep any more of your time, but I so appreciate this conversation. I think that's fabulous. And if you'll send me those links and everything that you're willing to share, I will. Be, I, will, <laughs> I, will be. I will definitely do that because I think the audience is going to be quite fascinated by this conversation, especially when I mention zombie ants. <laughs> <laughs> that's right that's right that's where you'll bring them in right the zombies yes yes and i'll have to come see you guys sometime up there because we're working for our journal with um simon fraser university oh cool also cool. in vancouver yeah that's very awesome. cool yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, i love vancouver our, our offices our offices are up on a area called the sunshine coast oh and wow that's where we do administrative we do a lot of testing there and stuff like that cool. there. i'm on vancouver island so so absolutely, nice. let us know. And, and I'll also send you a, a link to that article on the zombie ants. Please do that in your white paper too. I will send you white paper as well, yes. I absolutely. want to share all that information with everyone here because I have a very interesting audience that will find this intriguing. So awesome. they'll, they'll eat it up. Yeah, we, we have some good listeners. So, well, thank you again so much. And, and audience, I hope you enjoy this. Oh, I did, yeah. Thanks so much, Lori. I really had a good time. Thank you.